Hi, hello. Welcome to CMH Family Medicine Top Tips and Tutorials. I'm Dr. Madeleine Muller, um, and we're going to have a very short tutorial looking at the management of children with TB and especially the updates that's recently appeared in the Pediatric SCG and EML and was published in November 2023 um, on the um, Knowledge Hub. Now, what's a bit of a challenge is that we know that there are a new children's guideline, TB guideline, coming out very shortly. We're very excited about that. And I've had a little bit of a precursor that it will change even further. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to cover what's in the current EML, just in terms of treatment, um, because some people are not, are not aware of that. Um, but then I just want to give a little bit of a hint of what we've seen is coming. Um, but again, please don't follow that yet until we have the new published published guidelines. So what's back in, and this is also from the um, from the new guidelines, is that we did use treatment decision algorithms quite a bit in the past. And they sort of go in and out of fashion. This particular one is published again to try and help people, encourage people to to make a diagnosis of TB. And with this particular scoring system, you just score the different symptoms and you can see if they score more than 11, um, then you would definitely treat for TB. Important if they score under 11, then you may, um, you may still use your own discretion in terms of how likely you think your TB is. In the EML, they have it very simple. If you've got a child who's got signs and symptoms of TB and they've got a suggestive X-ray, you start them on TB treatment. Or if you've got a child with signs and symptoms suggested of TB, and they've definitely had a history of significant exposure, so for example, um, they've got a mom or somebody in the house that has TB, or they've got a positive man too, so you know they've been exposed to TB, they've got TB symptoms, you've probably treated them with an antibiotic and they haven't responded, all of those children, you will also start on TB. So we try and have quite a high index of suspicion. But ideally, you do want to try and get some sort of bacteriological confirm confirmation. Um, and our classic ways of doing that is usually gastric aspirates or sputum, sputum induction. And I just want to talk a little bit through, through our different options. So gastric aspirate, gastric lavage has been around for a long time. There's different stats in different um, papers in terms of how good it is um, now that we've got the gene expert. Um, and it's not bad, but actually induced sputum has been shown to have an even better a better sensitivity. Um, and in this particular study, there was no difference between HIV positive and HIV negative children. Um, and the big, the big thing is, is to get a, a proper sample. And the, you know, the better the sample is, the, the more likely it is that you're going to find something. So for your, those of you that might not be too aware of induced sputum, it's much easier to do than a gastric aspirate, so more achievable in your own setting. And what you do need to find, though, is a little they call a mucus trap. It's a little bottle with two tubes coming out of it. The one tube you connect to your, um, your suction machine and the other tube you're going to use to suction the back of the pharynx. So you literally measure the distance between the nostril and the earlobe and you just um, quickly suction it. Then all the material goes into your, into your little bottle. Um, before you do that, you want to try and create some mucus secretion. So you would normally nebulize the child in very small children, especially under two, you would first nebulize them with some salbutamol so they don't go into Brogan spasm. But then ideally you're going to um, you're going to nebulize them with either hypertonic saline or if you don't have just normal saline. Um, and then after they finish that nebulization, then you quickly do your suction. They don't have, they don't need to have been um, uh, fasting overnight, usually two or three hours will suffice. Um, and mom can just hold them on the lap. And it's it's definitely easier to do than trying to get in a, in a gastric tube. So very important if you've started a child on TB, still try and get a sample um, so we can check for rifampicin resistance. And just a little note with kids. So one does see occasionally otitis media or like a, a TB of the middle ear. And so if you do have a child that's got TB symptoms and they've got otorrhea, just send a sample off and who knows, you might find something on that. What's getting more exciting is looking at using um, either urine or stool. So when I talked about gene expert testing in general, expert ultra testing, I've got a little separate tutorial on that. I mentioned the study that was done on gene experts on urine and combining those with urinary lambs to actually get quite a good yield of confirmation. Um, but there's also a bit of work being done, done on stool. Um, and both of these urine and stool will need the NHLS to prepare the sample in a different way. And then it can just go into the normal um, expert bottles. You can see the sensitivity and specificity quite impressive there for stool samples as well. So there's already some recommendation of being able to do um, 
stool and urine um, at an NHLS lab, and some of the labs might already be trying that out, please don't send it to the lab unless you've checked that they know how to prepare those samples properly. What's interesting with both stool and urine is that it seems like it might be quite useful in both HIV positive and HIV negative children. Um, and that can just help us get some sort of bacteriological confirmation on kids with TB. So let's just go into the treatment. And just like we used to, there will be different um, types of treatment on whether the child's got complicated or uncomplicated TB. This is what's getting defined as complicated TB, for example, any malnourished child, very important, any HIV positive child and every child that is less than three years old. Um, lymphadenopathy only if it's causing some sort of occlusion or obstruction somewhere. And then, of course, if they've got quite severe local disease um, or if they've got disseminated disease, then all of those will get the complicated regimes. Everybody else we're going to treat as non-severe disease. So I'm going to show you now what the regimens look like as outlined in the, in the EML. Um, and then I'll also describe in terms of how it's going to change with the new guidelines. So I haven't put the new guidelines on the slide. <laughs> we are still forming. This is what we're following at the moment. So at the moment, there's still a recommendation that under eight-year-olds, we treat differently and you don't use ethambutol. So you use a combination of vampacin, INH, and PZA for two months as your intensive phase. And then the big thing to notice here, this was the big change, is that we only use a two-month continuation phase with a total four-month course for non-severe disease. So this is a huge change and takes some of the burden off our children. Then in the old guidelines, in the current guideline, if they're more than eight years old, then you do the classic Rifafol for two months, four tablets combination, and then Refina for two months. The thing that is changing, partly for programmatic reasons and partly because ethambutol has not been shown to be a major issue for that two-month period in small children in terms of eyes, which was always our worry, is that they want to bring in ethambutol routinely. So everybody gets three for four um, and refiner. But we'll wait for the new guidelines to confirm that. Severe disease we then treat as we always have. So Ripofor for two months and then your refiner for either four months to seven months, depending on the clinical scenario of your child. Just important to note that your TBM and your Millery TB is very different. Um, and I'll have a slide where I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. But you can see there you're using all four drugs for six or nine months. And we're replacing the ethambutol with ethionamide, which has a much better penetration of the blood-brain barrier. And that's only for children eight years and younger. So if we just look a little bit in your EML, you will find the dosing charts. And I just want to point out that you've got to watch out that you use the right dosing chart, depending on the preparation that you have. So our clinics now have this RHZ preparation, either as a dispersible tablet or actually as a solution. So that's your Afampsin, INH, PZA in one tablet. Um, and so, and then we use our, and then there's a RH, which is a 7550 combination, also a dispersible tablet or a solution. So very nice and easy to use for the children. So make sure you use this chart. If you don't have the RHZ or this new 7550 combinations, then we're back at the good old fashioned refiner 66 leak tablet. And there's a whole mechanism of how you mix that into water. Um, and just notice then that obviously that will be a very different dosing chart that you will be following. So if you've got children with severe disease, exactly the same thing. Just be aware of which RHZ um, preparation you have. Um, and if you've got RH not available, again, you're just going to use your RH, your PZA, and this time the ethambutol included. And then just a couple of words on Millery TB and, and TBM. So if you see a child with Millery TB, so lungs are looking bad, children are usually quite sick, we always assume that there's CNS involvement. So all children with Millery TB, we are going to treat as if they have TBM. And very important, this particular 7550 combination, um, the, the ratios just doesn't work in terms of the dosing you're going to give per kilogram for TBM. So in TBM, we do not use the 7550 preparations. We only use the 6060 RH preparations. And there's a very specific dosing chart exactly for that for in your EML. Um, and you can, you can see, for example, the INH is 20 milligrams per kilo. So it's, it's higher dosing than, for example, in our um, other children. So um, just be very, very aware which tablet am I prescribing and make sure that you're using the correct dosing chart. With children also, and that's a bit different than many of our other um, groups, 
Um, in our adults, for example, there is good evidence that steroids can make quite a bit of difference in terms of neurological outcomes and sequelae. Um, and so we normally add in some prednisone at two milligrams per kilo for four weeks, and then you taper um, over the next two weeks. Yeah, that is all from me on TB and children. We'll keep, we'll be waiting in great excitement for the new guidelines to come out. Um, and then we will do a webinar covering that in detail.